Does anyone have? Uh, as I said, I've unmuted everyone. Does anyone have a question? I have a question, Stuart, Chris. Uh, Stuart, um, during the class, I had a very unusual experience. I got a whack on the forehead and a mantra, and uh, a mantra I've never heard. And I wondered if I could tell it to you. Sure. Okay. It's Om Ma Hum, Sri Sharada Devi Siddhi Hum. From Sharada Devi, I guess. <laughs> uh, you know, I, you know, Chris, I, I don't have any answers to that. It might be some energy of a higher nature coming to you to teach you something. I, I don't know. I really don't know what that is. Okay. Uh, you can use it, you know, maybe it'll work and help you to grow inside yourself. You know, but I honestly can't tell you. I mean, obviously it's some kind of a mantra for Sarada Devi to come out, come down and probably give ex assistance in your growth. Oh, great. I'm, I'm not really, you know, I'm not up to mantras and I don't really do them. I have little, you know, things I do inside myself. They're not really mantras. You know, they're just little prayers and that really work for me. They work profoundly for me. They're not in Hindu. They're basically in, you know, Sanskrit. They're in English. Yeah. And they work profoundly, so I use them. But uh, in terms of Hindu mantras and all of that stuff, I, I don't know. There are people that swear by them, that do them all the time. And, and I hope that it works for them and it helps them to grow. So give it a shot, see what happens during the meditation. Just, you know, say it to yourself. I Let's will, thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone else have a question I would like to? I'm not saying mantras are negative, they're not. They're used in most ashram situations, people chant. When I was with Rudy and Muktananda came, you know, everybody was chanting their brains out, you know? And, uh, and the vibration gets strong in the room, you get a little stoned and it's good. But then I remember Rudy told me, he said, look, don't chant to it, just sit and work with the Shakti coming out of uh, Muktananda, you'll get much more. And I remember doing that and it was so powerful that it transformed me. You know, it really transformed me. But it taught me something, you know, about how to work with a teacher, <laughs> how to open to a teacher. It doesn't matter if the teacher is positive or negative or whatever goes on with the teacher. If the teacher is transmitting strong energy of some kind, you can take it inside yourself and use it to grow. And that's what happened with Muktananda. You know, I mean, I'm not a big fan of Muktananda, but I certainly benefited when he was at Big Indian, you know, uh, years ago. So, you, you know, I mean, <laughs> I remember I was sitting with Rudy in his apartment upstairs and classes started downstairs. And there was a lot of people chanting. And this was after Muktananda left the left New York and told Rudy that his students should stop doing the double breathing exercise and they should just chant. You know, the guru will sit there and everybody will chant. And we did that for about three months. And I remember I was sitting up with Rudy and, you, you know, all his students were downstairs chanting. And I said, Rudy, it's seven o'clock. Uh, it's time for class. And he said, Stuart, let the fanatics finish chanting. <laughs> downstairs. You know, I mean, he was talking about his own students. You know, let them finish chanting and then we'll go downstairs. I mean, 
uh, I loved what I loved about Rudy was this sacrifice, you know, sacri you know, he just was so irreverent. And uh, you know, and you know, and really only spoke about the direct transmission of Shakti growth, things that were real that had to do with getting grounded inside yourself and kind of things I talk about. And when it came to all this other stuff, I mean, it was a riot to be around him. I mean, you know, when Muktananda made him become celibate, he was, I was working, you know, uh, I was renovating a, a loft space for some photographer who wanted to put a gallery in there. And it was in one of Rudy's buildings. And I'll never forget, I was down there. I looked like a bloody coal miner, you know, covered with soot and scraping beams. And, and he came down there and he started telling me, he said, well, you know, Muktananda, <laughs> Muktananda said that I, I, I made a vow to him that I'd become a celibate. He said, but it doesn't mean I can't give somebody else, uh, you know, an orgasm. <laughs> and it just cracked me up. I said, Rudy, you're the only one in the world that could look at life this way. Yeah. You know, just see the bullshit and say, well, okay, if I can't have an orgasm, it doesn't mean I can't give somebody else an orgasm. And it was always like that, you know, the irreverence was so spiritual and it was so right on in terms of seeing life clearly and looking through that veil of illusion that not only surrounds everyday people, but a lot of people that practice all kinds of spiritual work. He was capable of cutting right through it and getting to the heart of the matter. And really, you know, and, and he did it in a very funny way. It wasn't, you know, angry, told Muktananda that, you know, look, I can't eat meat because cows don't eat meat, they eat grass. We're driving through the world of animals and outside of Dallas, and there's some lions that come. He said, Rudy, he said, Baba, I'm gonna have a lion steak tonight for dinner. He goes, <laughs> lions. I mean, I mean, it was hysterical to be around him and listen to him just cut through all the stuff and just, you know, tell tell it like it is, you know. We live in a real world and you know, and we have to function here as people dealing with reality in all its different levels. And there's no one answer for every person. Some people eat meat, some eat vegetables, some eat, I don't know what they eat anymore, you know? I mean, uh, all kinds of diets that are crazy and stuff like that, you know? People live in different ways and we can't set a set of regulations for everybody and think that's what's gonna get them to God. He once told me, you know, Tibetans eat meat and Indians eat vegetables. Does it make the Indians any more spiritual than the Tibetans? You know, it, it was incredible to listen to him and know what he talked about and how he was capable of cutting through that, you know, thin veil of illusion that even covers almost everybody that even does spiritual practice. You know, and I, I loved it. I loved it. You know, it was irreverent and it was funny as hell. And it really broke down all my beliefs. I mean, look, one of the first experiences I ever had with Rudy, right? And he was this young kid who was, you know, into all kinds of, you know, macrobiotic diets and chanting and all this stuff. You can't, you know, no alcohol, no this, no that, no smoke. And I'm sitting up in his apartment with him. And there's a group of people up there. He invited me to come up. And it was the first time I ever went up there and I'm sitting with him and he's sitting there on his chair, you know, in half lotus position, transmitting Shakti to all his students that were sitting around him. And in the middle of it all, he asked one of his students to go get him a scotch and water. You know, and I, I tell you, you know, it was to me, how can my guru be sitting there drinking scotch while he's transmitting God's energy? I, it, it just made me cry. I was ready to get up and leave. And then I said, no, Stuart, you're not here to judge him. You're here to get the energy. You're here to get the Shakti. You're here to get what is more profound than what goes on on the surface. You know, and it taught me such an amazing lesson. And the incredible thing about that is I never, in the six years I was with Rudy, ever saw him drink again. It was the only time I ever saw him drink. It was at that moment. You know, and it, it was just him 
through God teaching me something about non-judgmental, about what I'm really doing there, how I could have almost given up my guru, the person who basically saved my life and made it possible for me to do even what I'm doing today. Uh, if I would have gotten into that whole righteous judgment of how could my guru be drinking scotch and water while, you know, while he's watching the Dick Van Dyke show on television and transmitting Shakti, you know? I mean, it was incredible what you had to learn. And he taught me that all through my studies with him. I mean, I was made a spiritual teacher, literally, at a poker game. You know? I mean, this is really the truth. I was playing, we were big Indian and Rudy loved to play poker. So we're playing poker. There's a class in 15 minutes. And, you know, we had spent the whole morning working, doing all kinds of, you know, intense labor at the ashram there, and working, you know, roofing and building walls and all kinds of stuff, you know. And, we're, you know, just to relax, we're playing poker. You know, and it wasn't a lot of money, you know, a penny, a nickel, it was like that, you know. And suddenly I hear this poke in my ribs. And the client is, how would you like to teach the class? I pick up my poker hand and he hits me in the ribs. How would you like to teach the class today? And I looked at him with a smile on my face and I said, Rudy, you always do this to me. <laughs> I mean, in the most absurd, irrational, you know, place to ever be made a spiritual teacher, a guru at a poker game. You know, it began the beginning of the most extraordinary adventure I ever took in my life, which was learning how to do what I do today. So one never knows. And the worst thing of all is just being righteous about it has to be this way. It has to be that way. It has to be another way. You know, I don't know how it has to be. And my thing is that anything that gets people closer to God you know, I'm all for, you know, and I, and I have no judgments about it, whether it's mantras, whether it's Christianity, Judaism, whatever people do, Islam, whatever they do to get them closer to God. You know, it's not for me to judge them, because whatever it is that comes into their life, they have to deal with. You know, they have to deal with. And I, 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 and I have respect for that. And I basically learned that from Rudy, from all these irreverent, you know, spiritual things I went through with him, you know, and I, it just taught me not to judge. Just take the energy, take the Shakti. If a teacher doesn't transmit Shakti and it's all intellectual stuff, find another teacher that transmits Shakti, even if you don't like the other teacher, but if energy is flowing through them in a real way that can make you work deeper on yourself, then you have found somebody who can help you. I mean, I know Rudy, I've talked about, he spent 13 years with Muktananda and, and he told me he would go there, spend like a week there in the ashram there, he would do his spiritual work and he would run. I see, he said, I used to run for the hills. And then he began to describe to me all the tests that Muktananda put him through. Astral tests, cosmic tests. I mean, it was, it was just staggering. And I said to him, why do you do this? After, and even after when Muktananda came to the America and I spent a lot of time around him. We went to Dallas together, Rudy, Muktananda, myself, and a whole coterie of people. And I said to Rudy, I saw what used to go on. I said, why do you do this? He said, Stuart, he's the only person I've ever met who can break me down. And this is something that I think most of you don't understand, having to be broken down. And, I, and I, it taught me such a profound lesson that I had to use in my dealings with Rudy because he was constantly breaking me down, constantly breaking me down. He did it with love. He did, there was, I mean, he did it with joy in his heart. He did it with knowing that I was kind of like a spiritual son to him, but he spent years doing that and teaching me, you know, how to deal with that, how to be broken down, how not to let any level I attain in my life be the ultimate of what I can do in terms of my spiritual development. 
So all of this works together. And it's not a matter of liking or disliking or this or that, you know, it's a matter of what do I need to do to grow? What do I need really to do to grow? And not accepting in yourself some bullshit solution, you know, is an answer, something that's easy, you know, because having a spiritual life, honestly, is never easy, not easy can't be easy. You're trying to do the most difficult thing that a human being can do on the earth, which is attain a oneness with God. And the reason, as I say all the time, it's not easy, is we're up against one person who keeps us from doing it, and that's ourselves. And we need to be broken down inside. And if we're not broken down inside, we're stuck with us, with our righteousness, with our opinions, you know, with our judgments, with what we think is right or wrong. And in the ultimate goal of it, it's just all bullshit. The only thing that's real is becoming nothing inside and becoming one with God. I mean, is this clear? What I'm, I hope so, you know, I mean... I, Somebody might get up and run out of the room. <laughs> I don't know. This is tough stuff. But, you know, it's a very difficult job attaining spiritual enlightenment. And you can't soft pedal it and easy coat it and put a veneer on it and think, you know, that, you know, you're holier than thou and that's righteous. And, you know, that, that's all nonsense. I mean, Rudy told me I, I want to do, I want to live my life so that there's absolutely nothing for me to have to come back for. I want to eat from every dish on God's smorgasbord on the table. So there's nothing for me to come back for. And that to me was an extraordinary expression of his vision. He also told me that I'll never forget it. He said, Stuart, you know, I'll never forget Nichananda going to sleep on a potato sack. I would love my inner life to get that simple, but I could almost live that way, you know? And meanwhile, he owned blocks of land and buildings in New York. <laughs> he was a very rich guy, <clears throat> tremendously successful in business. And yet I'm standing there with him and he said this. He said, I'll never forget Nichananda going to bed on a potato sack. And it inspires me to work on myself so I can get that simple inside. That simple inside. That's good. <clears throat> oh, does anyone have a question after all this? <laughs> Okay, if there are no questions, then I have just two announcements. So, you know, I told you that there'll be no meditation class tomorrow evening. Uh, I have something I have to go do that came up a long time ago, and it turns out it's tomorrow. And uh, also, uh, I, I, I hate to announce this, but I don't think I'm going to have a birthday retreat. I mean, not enough people signed up and uh, it's just getting, it's got too complicated. So I think I might have to cancel it. Pretty sure I will cancel it. There weren't enough people that made a commitment to do it. And, uh, and I'm not gonna knock my brains out doing that just to accommodate people. I mean, I really, you know, want people to make the effort and have, in order to grow in this life, you got to go beyond yourself. Any kind of, you know, state of comfort and this, you, know, you got to do that. Otherwise, 
you know, I remember in India, Rudy, he was really, he was going through a really rough time there. And he was opening to so much energy was coming through him. And I was with him there, you know, and he looked at me and he said, Stuart, I don't want to hear any more of your lip service gratitude bullshit. He told me this. I used to write him these letters, how grateful I am, how grateful I am, how grateful I am. He said, show it to me through your actions. I don't want to hear it. I'm not interested in lip service gratitude. And boy, that was a lesson for me. My whole life changed that moment when I realized that gratitude and the expression of gratitude, service in the world, doing in the world comes because of our activity, the actions we do, not because of the words that come out of our mouth. It's easy to express these things. It's very hard to commit and do and make sacrifices and and doing in an extraordinary way that way, because we do, we, we're living, acting people. And we have to learn how to live, you know, with un unconditional love, with gratitude, with compassion, with being there for other people, not by uh, what the, the words we say, because the words we say it becomes just air, you know? It's really through our activity our actions, what we do to serve God in the world. So, you know, not enough people signed up. Maybe we'll do it another time. And I didn't even contact, you know, Stony Point about it because I wanted to see who signed up before I start getting involved with negotiating a, you know, a weekend there with them. So I think that they're probably, yeah, yeah. And I'm just, I'm not going to chase people. If people want it, they're going to have to come and get it. They're going to have to make commitments. I mean it. Otherwise, it doesn't work. It really doesn't work. So I'm sorry to say that, but uh, I had no other choice in the matter. Uh, does anyone have a question about any of this? Okay. All right. And again, God bless you all for being in these classes, for coming here, for doing this. I mean, if you weren't here, the things I talked about this evening would not have come through me. And I, I really mean that. And I am just grateful we do this. This is not easy for me to do. I do seven of these classes a week. You know, it's not easy to do this. There's a lot of people in every class. It's not like there's one or two people that come five people, you know, there's 25 to 35 people that attend every one of these classes. And, and it's not easy to do, but I'm grateful to do it because look what comes, look what came tonight. Because every one of you have been present here. Every one of you is sitting and doing deep inner work, the meditation practice. And that's, that's what comes when people make an effort. If people don't make an effort, nothing comes. Nothing comes. You know, when I went on vacation, it really, in a sense, wasn't a vacation, you know? But two people came here. One came here when I said I would, I'm open for people to come and, you know, have classes here and all that. Two people did come. One stay, is staying for a month. And the other one stayed for two weeks. And both of them came with me on this vacation. And we had meditation class twice a day. And by the time that four or five days was over, I'm telling you, I never saw people change as much. It was extraordinary. And it really was extraordinary because of the effort they made, an opportunity to come and sit with their teacher, to spend a month, to spend two weeks, to be here. And I thought it was amazing. And it really forced me to work hard because I respected it so much. So that it was more than a vacation. It was something amazing that took place in that two weeks. So I'm telling you all this because gratitude is not lip service. Gratitude is doing. And they said, I am so grateful to all of you being here that I do seven of these classes a week. 
all over the world with people because that really is the key to all of this. You know, sharing love, being willing to serve other people, be willing to do things, to go beyond oneself, you know, in terms of doing in the world. So all of this is a lesson, not only for you, it's a lesson for me too, about what has to be done in order to grow spiritually. It's like Rudy always should say, we're going to live in the Middle East. Like whoever thought about living in the Middle East? Uh, yeah, my bags are packed, Rudy. Whenever you want to go, I'm ready to go. You know, I mean, I, he, all the time he would do this. And I said, my spiritual life, and look, I was 25 years old, 27 years old. I was young. And I didn't have, you know, a lot of you have family ties and all kinds of stuff like that, you know. But I also, at that age, recognized, Stuart, where are you going to find a person like this again to help you in your spiritual practice? Once you go live in the Middle East, go live in a desert, for God's sake. What does it matter as long as you can continue to work with him and get the energy? I mean, that's the way I approached it. Go to Denton, Texas. You know, I mean, my God, I lived in Paris, Rome, you know, Greece, Morocco. I mean, I lived all over the world, for God's sake. And he sent me to Denton, Texas. And when I complained to him, Rudy, this has been a hell of a three, you know, hell of a three weeks. It was like two months later. He said, you're on your third day. You know, I learned. I learned. Do the impossible. Do the impossible. Work your way out of this. It took nine years to work my way out of the situation. Built that house, restaurants. I mean, it was unbelievable what was going on there, you know? You know, but nine years. And then finally I said, if I stay another year here, I'm going to die. I got to go where my life can expand. So I moved back to New York. So what I'm saying is it's the activity that shows gratitude. It's how one interacts with the world that really is the greatest expression of, of how gratitude can be expressed in life. Okay, if there are no questions, God bless you all. Thank you. And uh, in all humility, I'm just grateful to be here doing this with all of you. And hopefully, you know, the lessons I've learned in my life can be passed on to many of you. And you can use, you know, some of them in your own way, not in my way, in your own way, you know, to truly get closer to God. So bless you all. Thank you. And we'll have meditation class actually on this coming Wednesday. So bless you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. All right.